this evening. It's, um, it's really great to have so much enthusiasm here. I'm going to be talking for a little while about uh, bees needs and in some ways this is going to be a little bit of a rant um, but hopefully mostly it'll just be me enthusing about the wonderful world of pollination and thinking about how we can do things better for them. So the obligatory acknowledgements just thanking all the various funders and collaborators that I've worked with is an on book that I might touch on today and then I'll move on to bees in the UK. So a lot of people, when we say bees, immediately think of the honeybee. But when we think about bees in the UK, we've got one species of honeybee. We've got somewhere around 27 species of, of bumblebee, depending on which ones you count as extinct or still here or possibly just getting a bit rare. Um, the vast majority of bees in the UK, species wise, are the approximately 250 species of solitary bee. And these are hugely diverse in size, in ecology, in characteristics, uh, and they're spread across six different families within the bees and 29 genera in total. So really, when we should be thinking about bees in the UK, we really should be thinking about those wonderful, amazing solitary bees, as well as the social bees that are perhaps more familiar. So just to give an overview of some of our UK bees, the honeybee, is important. It's close to many people's hearts. I'm sure there's at least one beekeeper in the audience today. Um, they're very important to our food supply and of course they're creators of honey, but majority of them are from uh, subspecies that don't originate from the UK and the vast majority are essentially managed livestock. So they're controlled by people living in hives rather than being truly wild. Um, so that means that they're not a conservation concern in the same way that the wild bees are. So while there some, might be some subspecies that are in decline, for example, it's more of a kind of livestock management problem rather than a true conservation issue. By comparison, bumblebees, aside from some that are com um, commercially bred in, in the commercial sector for fruit pollination, are wild bees. And these are the kind of main seven species that you're most likely to see. So they're quite diverse in size and in coloration. Uh, Bombus terrestris is probably the most familiar and common, but we've also got some new species. Bombus hypnorum has been with us for about 15 years now. And then moving into the solitary bees. Um, if you're gonna get into them, I find that the Andrina genus is probably one of the most fun. So these are medium sized bees, a little bit smaller than a honeybee. And they span from some of these species at the left, Andrina florea and Andrina hatorfiana, which are extreme specialists. They only use one or two plant species. So white bryony in the case of Andrina florea or scabious in the case of Andrina hatorfiana to some of these other Andrina species that I'm presenting here, um, which are much more generalist. They'll use a wide variety of flowers. So this means that within the Andrinas, we've got everything from very common species that you might have seen in your garden already this year, early spring emerging bees, through to incredibly rare ones with very restricted ranges. But they're relatively tractable to identify, even though they are quite a big group. So that's why I'm quite fond of them. We've also got um, some more curious bees. So what a lot of people don't realize is that one of the small and relatively unremarkable bee species, uh, Lassioglossum calciatum, is actually sitting in a weird hinterland in between being a solitary bee that makes a nest all on its own and one of the social bees, um, like honeybees and bumblebees that live in colonies with a queen. So they're on this weird gradient uh, geographically in the UK where the more southerly ones are this kind of semi-social, sub-social species um, with about two to three bees working together to make a nest and perhaps one of the females that are working together on that doing a bit more of the reproduction and the other two doing more of the work. Um, whereas further north, they are just like normal solitary bees in terms of single females setting up nests on their own. Um, and it's something that's really understudied and not a lot of people seem to talk about it. And yet I feel this is an amazing system that we have right in our back gardens. And I mean that quite literally, um, because this is a very common species that's seen in garden, 
We've also got some cool new species. So Kalites hederi turned up in the UK in about 2009 on the south coast. It's a specialist on ivy. So it got to the UK and discovered that there's an abundant resource available. There's not a lot of competition for it because honeybees use it a little bit. Some of the late season bumblebees will use it a little bit. And otherwise it's mostly only having to compete with wasps for this wonderful abundant nectar resource. So it spread. It's marched north over the last 12 years or so. Um, so that was in the first couple of years that it arrived. Those um, red and green dots are where it was in the first couple of years. So it was very much a southerly species. But by 2016, it had got up to the Mid Midlands. And by 2020, I think we're now starting to get the first sightings in Scotland. And all of those kind of gaps on the map are getting backfilled as it colonizes more and more places. So, um, yeah, it's really making the most of being in the UK and it's, it's a very cute bee and it's probably quite familiar um, to many people now because it is one of the few solitary bees that you see in about October, really late in the season when most other things have gone away. Another rather exciting newcomer to the UK or perhaps recomer is another species of Andrina, this cute little grey backed kind of ashy backed mining bee. So all of the Andrinas are ground nesting bees. They make like those little volcanoes in your lawn that you see sometimes. Um, but this one was, uh, it had a few very old records. So pre 1950s, um, just perhaps four or so historical records. And then it vanished from the UK and there was nothing for ages. And then in the 21st century, it reappeared. Um, initially just at Dungeness in Kent, and then at a site in Hampshire, and now it's slowly starting to move inland in the southeast of the UK. And this is another example of an extreme specialist bee. So this is only really interested in using willow pollen at the start of the year. So um, yeah, that's a charming bee. It probably will never get quite as widespread as Kalites hederi, the ivy bee, but it will probably spread quite considerably and we might even start to see it in places like London and North Kent over the next few years um, and it doesn't really look like very many other species so it, it could be quite an interesting little flagship bee as a as a success story. Um, a lot of this talk won't be about those success stories so let's cling on to the happy moments. Um, there's more weird and wonderful bees in the UK there's a kind of almost huge variety, infinite diversity in some ways of different lifestyles that we can see. We've got wool carder bee, so the females of this species visit hairy leafed plants and trim off those leaves using their big jaws, their big mandibles, and to make this little ball of like cotton wool, which they fly off to, um, fly off with and take it to their nest and they use those fibres to line the inside of their nest and make it all nice and cozy and waterproof for their offspring. The males are absolute thugs. They patrol these plants and basically knock all of the other bees off the flowers. So it's quite a remarkable bee and again they're doing quite well in the UK partly because we're growing more Mediterranean plants and Stachys byzantina in particular is, is a very popular plant for them. If you have a big enough patch in the southeast within about five years you're bound to get them. Um, here's an unusual bee, Macropis. It only uses um, the, this uh, Lychnis, the, the yellow one, and it doesn't just visit for the pollen and the nectar, it specifically co collects floral oils from this. Um, so from this yellow loose strife, sorry, had a moment there. Uh, yellow loose strife, it collects the floral oils from, and again, it uses those oils to line the nest. So it's very rare because it's only found in the places where you get wild yellow loose strife. Um, there's also a huge diversity of, of cuckoo bees in the UK. So like this Melecta albifrons, these are bees that sneak into the nests of other bees and lay their eggs. And then their larvae consume the food resources that, um, that the original mother bee of the other species painstakingly collected and gathered so she might have collected a beautiful pollen ball and left it there for her offspring. The cuckoo bee offspring will hatch earlier and will consume that pollen ball and kill the other bees um, offspring as well. And many of the species of um, regular pollen collecting bees in the UK have a cuckoo 
And these can be hugely different in shape and form. Some of them look like wasps. Some of them are quite cute and hairy, like this Melecta albifrons, which is uh, the cuckoo of um, the hairy footed flower bee, which you might see if you've got pulmonaria or comfrey in your garden at the moment, they tend to patrol those patches. Uh, we've also got leaf cutter bees like Megachile centuncularis, which is the one, uh, these are the species that cut those little half moon shaped discs out of your, um, out of your leaves of various plants. They particularly like rose and uh, enchanter's nightshade in our garden seems to get a walloping for some reason. And the hylaeus bees, which rather than collecting pollen on their legs or on their belly as Megachile do, they store it inside. So they never have these specially adapted legs with the hairs on the way you see on other bees. So that's just a kind of overview of just how amazing and wonderful our UK bees are. But we have to remember as well that it's not just bees that pollinate. Um, pretty much any group of insects that you can think of, there's probably an example from somewhere in the world where it's been found pollinating something at some point. And that's something that we need to keep in mind when we're doing things like habitat management and habitat restoration is that it's not just all about the bees. And some of these things have specific habitat requirements like uh, they need water or they need a larval food plant that we'd need to provide as well. So just as the bees can be on a generalist specialist gradient, the plants that they use can also be on a gradient from quite generalist plants. So this yarrow, for example, it's got flowers that are open. They've got easy to access nectar and pollen. And this means that they can be used by everything from a fly to a butterfly to a beetle. At the far end of the spectrum, you have things like um, this bee orchid. And they're very specialist in which pollinators can visit them and which pollinators will transfer their pollen. This uh, particular species pollinates by sexual deception. So that means it releases sex pheromones of a particular species of Eucera bee that we don't even have in the UK. Um, and he is lured in thinking that this is a super female that he needs to mate with. And no other species will respond to those pheromones. So no other species really bothers to visit the flowers. And other plants all around the world can be anywhere on that spectrum from being visited by almost anything to being visited by just one or a few species. So it's amazing the range of adaptations that we get um, and ones for particular pollinators. So this Lantana camara has evolved to retain both its old and its younger flowers. But when the pollinator moves in, it realizes that only the yellow flowers need pollinating and have a nectar reward. The pink flowers, they're old, they're done for, they don't need pollinating and they don't provide nectar. So they've got this kind of honest signaling process where the big array of flowers brings the pollinators in, but once they're there, they go, actually, can you only visit those yellow ones? Uh, we've got morphology is a way that plants can um, filter or select the pollinators that visit them. So a snapdragon, for example, has this trip mechanism that means that only large bees are able to open it up and enter in order to access the nectar. Um, this means that smaller bees that are not such efficient transferers of the pollen, so can't pollinate them as well, are discouraged from trying to enter. However, Bees, because they're really smart, have found a way around that. So this Queen Bombus terrestris has run into this sort of problem with these complicated red clover flowers. And they, again, have got a bit of a trip mechanism to get into them. And she really has to stretch her tongue to the limit to be able to get down the long corolla and access that nectar. So what she's done instead is chewed little holes in the base of each of those little flowers and has bypassed all of the plant's reproductive parts within there in order to just access the nectar at the base of the flower. And this is a problem for the plant because it means it's expending all of this energy making nectar but not getting any pollination in return. So the plants fight back. One of the ways that plants do fight back is to use their chemistry. So plants are amazing chemical factories. They can synthesize so many things, which you're probably well aware of if you like cooking, because you've got all of these culinary herbs that have got wonderful different aromas that are adding flavor to your food. Um, this is aconitum, 
and it's able to produce aconitine, which is a pretty toxic alkaloid, and it expresses that in its nectar and in its petal hood. It's legitimate pollinators, a long-tongued bees, that come in the legitimate way, and they're also able to tolerate aconitine in the nectar, so it doesn't um, cause them any problems. But if a bee does try to chew a hole in the base and rob it, those bees tend to be the short-tongued bees and they're not able to cope with the aconitine, it's toxic to them. So essentially they're punished for their treachery by becoming quite poorly. And this nectar chemistry is a wonderful and again unexplored area or underexplored. There's many wonderful compounds that we find in the nectar of flowers, some of which have got quite important pharmacological uses. So Nicotiana, for example, has nicotine in the nectar, and there are theories that it might be getting the insects addicted or discouraging them from drinking too much by tasting bitter. Caffeine in nectar is um, found in the nectar of uh, coffee plants and some citrus plants, and there's a lot of exciting research happening about what effect that caffeine has on bee pollinators. Um, some work that we've been doing is looking at if you add caffeine to the nectar that bees are consuming, does it help them to form stronger memory associations and can that be used by farmers? So we have been using caffeine literally to train bees to be more loyal to the strawberry flowers on strawberry farms so that they work harder, pollinate better, get less distracted by surrounding plants. Um, and hopefully provide farmers with better value because these are commercial colonies that are quite expensive to the farmer. So um, that's, that's an area that we've been working on recently. However, it's not all happy for bees um, and in the UK and more widely in Europe and worldwide, a lot of bees and different species have undergone range changes over the past few decades. This is an example, Bombus sylvarum, the shrill carder bee, and it used to be a really widespread English bee species. It really loves flower rich meadows. Unfortunately, flower rich meadows are in decline. Um, there's increasing use of agrochemicals. There's lots of land use changes. So now it's restricted to really just half a dozen areas within the UK. And it really has had a catastrophic range collapse. And this is a pattern that's been seen for many of the UK bee species. As a result, people are getting more aware that there is a problem, which is good. Unfortunately, the, the tone of that debate and the information available is still very honeybee centric. So these were just some examples of uh, different reports that thought that they were talking about bees and biodiversity, but we're back on this rather annoying managed livestock species and somewhat neglecting the fact that there's far more species of bee that need our help far more urgently. Um, one that was particularly annoying people this week was UNESCO's Women for Bees project, which seems to involve actually putting honeybee hives into protected areas. So putting them into conflict or competition with wild bee species. Um, so I found it a little bit strange, this idea of beekeeping and biodiversity being seen to be somehow partners when much of the time they can actually be almost opposite to each other. Um, one of the adages that's becoming quite common among pollination ecologists now is that keeping honeybees to save the bees is a bit like keeping chickens to save the birds. So what is wrong with beehives and what's wrong with beekeeping? Well, nothing in and of itself, but you have to be aware of the fact that it's not always the benefit for crops or for biodiversity that people think it is. So here, for example, this is a, a study from um, Europe where they looked at uh, the pollination and the strawberry fruit set on farms with and without honey beehives. And yeah, you got you've got some fruit set on the grey bars, so that's indicating how many fruit were set where you had hives present. But where you removed the hives, you got more fruit set, so reducing the number of honeybees was actually good for the crop. And this was because the wild bees then had less competition, were able to move in and pollinate more effectively because they're a little bit messier, they tend to smear pollen over themselves a bit more, whereas honeybees tend to groom it off. Also, beehives are not necessarily good for wild bees. 
Um, so this was a study from France where they looked at uh, apiaries close to wild areas uh, and further away from wild areas and looked at the amount of wild bee foraging that happened in those areas. And where there were beehives close to where the wild bees were foraging, they foraged less and they were less successful at finding nectar. So we do need to be quite careful about where we're putting beehives. Um, if it was up to me, I'd probably ban them within a half mile of nature reserves full stop. It's probably a bit more nuanced than that. But we need to be aware of whether we're overstocking with beehives, given that plant rich areas are now sometimes so few and far between. And that leads us into wildflower meadows. So this is a really popular response to the fact that bees are now known to be in decline. There's pollinator Armageddon, if you like, but not all of these wildflower meadows are really what people claim they are. So I've deliberately chosen these three pictures because they've all got quite obviously non-native species, um, ones that just simply wouldn't be found in a natural UK wildflower meadow. Um, here's another example so this was an actual seed retailing business that I encountered recently and this was the list of wildflower seeds that come in their mix so I thought okay where do these all come from and plotted them onto a map and some of those species are from the UK and Europe but quite a few of the species in that list as I work through are from North American prairies and some even from Australia so it wasn't really giving us a, a particularly good recreation of a UK wildflower meadow. Is that bad? Is it a problem? I mean, if you're a botanist, I'm sure it is a problem. Um, what about if you're a pollination ecologist? It's a mixed question. So the majority of them are not like bad or harmful in and of itself. Um, they may not be meeting the bees needs. So first, we might need to think about the nutritional profile of the resources they provide. Bees eat nectar and pollen, um, but while the nectar is mostly just sugar solution, it does have other things in it. It's got amino acids in, it's got all of those interesting nectar chemistry components. Um, and if those are components that the bee is not co-evolved with, they may be bad for the bee. Um, and in particular, the pollen is really important because that's feeding the bees offspring. That's their major source of protein and it's their major source of other nutrients. Um, one that is being really previously understudied but is only just now beginning to be uncovered is sterols. So these are kind of plant um, fat components, if you like, and the bees get them from the pollen in order to make cells and grow and things like that. And it seems like there's a huge diversity of sterols and every bee species needs a particular profile or balance of them, kind of a unique recipe in order to develop maximally. Now, it doesn't matter necessarily what analysis has happened here, but these dots here all represent one plant species unique recipe of sterols and you can see they're all different every one is a little bit different from others and depending on what pollinates that plant seems to determine a little bit of what type of recipe they've got so the bee pollinated plants have got a slightly different sterile recipe to bird pollinated plants or butterfly pollinated plants and we really don't have a full idea of what sterols particular bees need and whether using non-native plants in an array would support the sterile needs of a native bee. So this is, a, this is a huge area that hopefully will become more important in conservation in the future. So thinking about whether the plants we're providing meet the needs of the bees that we're trying to conserve. So I mentioned that some introduced plants are even potentially harmful to non-co-evolved pollinators. Um, an example of this is rhododendron. So the nectar of rhododendron has a compound in called guanotoxin, which some species of bee can tolerate and use it happily, but will kill various other species of bee. Um, it's particularly quite bad for honeybees, as it happens, whereas uh, bumblebees tolerate it quite well. And especially in areas where there's too much of a plant that's got particular toxin, that can start to form problems. 
The other trouble with a lot of these artificial flower meadows is that they haven't really taken account of like the local populations of plants, the local habitat mosaic, or the structures that need to be provided. So people might use the same seed mix to make an artificial meadow in Lincolnshire and Cornwall um, without necessarily thinking about what's the local plant assemblage, what kind of habitats are you trying to match up and what kind of bees are you trying to cater for? Another thing that's really important actually is gardens. So while I've just kind of had a bit of a moan about non-native plants, gardens are actually full of them, but they're also full of weeds and native species. And what they tend to do is have quite a high diversity in a relatively small unit area. And they also tend to be managed by the gardener in order to ensure that they've got flowers happening all year round. So they can actually be a brilliant resource. And if you compare that to a big agricultural field, then they can be something really quite special. And this has been looked at in quite a few studies now. Here's a little graph to show how the different components of a garden can contribute. So those red bars with the house on top, those are the native species in the garden and how many pollinators they're attracting. So mostly it's the native species in the garden that tend to be getting those pollinators in. The exotic species tend not to be as attractive to the pollinators, except if you see right at the beginning and right at the end of the year. So some of those imported species can have value at times when very little else is in flower. They're providing important resources that some of those particularly common pollinators can use. So they might not meet the needs of the rare and the specialist pollinators, but they might be a valuable energy reserve for some of those common pollinators. So during lockdown, I got involved in the back garden pollinator survey and I got a bit carried away with this. So I was doing it pretty much daily from April to July and then intermittently after that until it was taking about 45 minutes a day and I was starting to realise this was out of control. But it's provided me with an enormous data set of what pollinators are using which species of plant in my garden and it's, it's been wonderful getting those insights. So these are the kind of top eight plants. Uh, the winner in terms of the total number of insect visits that I recorded, the total number of interactions was hands down the oxide daisy. So really lovely meadow plant. Um, as you can see though, it was an interesting mixture of native and non-native plants that performed well in terms of attracting in large numbers. But when we start to look at the diversity, so this is how many different uh, types of visitor we get, how many different species, um, the oxide daisy was still winning very excessively. But things like the giant echium and the comfrey, which got large numbers, actually the visitors were mostly of a relatively restricted diversity of species. So I thought that was quite interesting. So there's some plants that are said to be good for pollinators, but in reality, you perhaps should say good for pollinator because there's only really a small number of species that make use of them. Um, I did record at least 39 different bee species. There were some that I wasn't able to resolve quite to species level, but I was really impressed with just how many species there were in my garden. It's not a particularly big garden, uh, and we're in a fairly unexciting bit of North Kent. We're not on the chalk here, and we're amongst uh, mostly agricultural fields. What I did learn is that some plants got almost no pollinators at all in the whole time. So Achebia, Alcamilla and Crocosmia were pretty much flops. Uh, also some plants that are sold as being good for pollinators, they got visited, but really just by the same things. So the borage was nice, but not that much of a diversity. And similarly, Echinops, Hebe, Hellebore and Flowering Current, all quite popular, but not for that many different interesting and more unusual species. So what are we missing here when we're doing this habitat creation for bees? We're not really thinking through the pros and cons of native versus exotic in a rational way. Sometimes there's a value to putting in a few exotic species if that's what it takes to win a local area over and make them accept a wildflower meadow, but they probably shouldn't be the core of a wildflower meadow. 
We also need to think about the continuity of forage. So having the right resources available at the times of year when different bee species need them the most um, and making sure that there aren't any real gaps uh, during the main season where there isn't energy resources, even for generalist bees. We need to think about whether we're providing enough diversity to meet bees nutritional needs. In general, if there's enough of a diversity there, bees will be able to sort themselves out, at least the generalist species. Um, the specialist species, really, if the plant is there, they'll be able to use it. If the plant isn't there, then you'll never get that bee. And that's pretty much the long and short of it. But we need to take a holistic view of all of these bees and other pollinators life cycles. What do they need at different stages? So we've talked loads about um, flower resources and food and what they eat, but what about the rest of their life cycle? That's only a small part of it. Um, and one thing we often don't think about much is nesting sites. We really don't give enough consideration to whether the nesting resources and particularly the soils there and whether it meets bees needs. So there's a bit of research now coming through where we're understanding that bees can be quite fussy depending on the species about the aspect. So does it get enough sun to warm up? Things like the texture that they need that determines whether they can dig in it. And other more subtle factors like um, the moisture, whether it's contaminated with pesticides, whether it's covered in vegetation or whether it's bare. And sometimes people have left areas of bare soil hoping to encourage pollinators of apple orchards, for example, only to realise that most of the species that are the best pollinators of apple prefer slightly vegetated soil, so they've been encouraging the wrong bees all along. And a lot of this is really poorly understood on a species by species basis, so we really don't fully yet know what soil you need for Andrina cineraria versus Andrina hatorfiana, for example. There's lots of work now though to try and promote bee diversity in the UK and it's getting better in some areas. Uh, one of my favourite success stories, which starts off sounding like a flop but turns into something positive, is the work that the, sub uh, the Bombus subterraneous shorthead bumblebee reintroduction project has been doing. So this is a species of bumblebee that went extinct probably before the 1980s and they decided in the 2000s that they wanted to reintroduce it to the UK. So they captured queen bees from Sweden and brought them down to Dungeness in Kent and re-released them after a quarantine period and it didn't work. However, Another core part of that project was habitat creation, and this has been an absolute runaway success. It's been working with landowners, and the focus has been on providing resources, um, so habitats, nesting resources, and foraging resources, especially for long-tongued bumblebees, because they tend to be the ones that are most in decline in a lot of areas. And by working with landowners, and especially farmers, they've managed to enrich around 2,000 hectares of habitat such that now there's several other species that were in decline in Kent that are now starting to range expand again. So while sub T itself, subterraneous, didn't benefit particularly from this project, um, other species of bumblebee have really done well out of it. So it's not all doom and gloom. Globally, there's about 20,000 species of bee. So the UK is just a tiny snapshot of what we've got all over the world. And there's probably a lot that we don't know, especially in tropical areas, uh, rainforests, and probably as well in places like the Himalayas, where there's a lot of diversity, but it's quite hard to get to. Overseas, they have many of the same problems as we have in the UK, with a reduction in abundance and diversity, so fewer bees and fewer types of bee, and as a result, a damage to some of those pollination services. We've been doing some work with farmers in uh, Malawi and in Tanzania, and more recently a little bit in Kenya, about managing habitats for beneficial insects and for bee pollinators of beans in particular, because beans are such a major crop in these areas. One of the ones that we've been focusing on is carpenter bees. So they're a little bit like bumblebees in terms of the types of flowers that they visit and the size and their appearance, but they are a solitary bee species, but they're really important for beans. 
And what we've discovered is a positive relationship between um, having more plants, more diversity of plants on your smallholder farm in East Africa, and in particular, having a higher diversity of trees on your farm. And those are associated with having more carpenter bees visiting your crop. So this is a really positive direction. It means that we've got some real evidence that implies that managing your farm to increase those things could really pay off in terms of um, pollination services. However, what we discovered when we started to look at those interactions, so these yellow boxes along the top are the different types of flower visitor that we got on the farms. The green boxes along the bottom are the different plants that were on one of the farms that we looked at and the grey bars in between, those are the interactions. So the thicker the bars, the more interactions there are. And we realised that a lot of those commonly visited plants on farms, so the ones that seem to be doing the most to support pollinators, I've given them the sunglasses to indicate that those are exotic introduced species, so mostly tropical weeds from South and Central America. So if we're encouraging farmers to support this plant diversity and grow more of those plants, we're essentially telling them to grow invasives. So this has put us in a little bit of a difficult position deciding what's the best way to proceed from here on in. The, um, the thing with the green bean symbol next to it is the crop, by the way. So that's being visited by honeybees, bee flies and carpenter bees primarily. Those are the ones that we might want to focus on. So that brings me to about the point where it's ready to, to draw this to a close. So. I guess what we can reflect on is the UK has got more bee species than most people really think about. And most of them are not those social bees that live in hives, they're solitary bees that go it alone. Some of them are specialists on one or a few plant species. Some are generalists that will use many things and they tend to be the ones that are more robust to environmental fluctuations. But a lot of conservation schemes, while they're good and they are doing a lot of good, can be a little bit flower centric, sometimes honeybee centric, and can end up dominated by plants that um, support generalist bees that were already common at the expense of the rare ones that really need it. So we need to know the biology and the ecology of our local area to decide how to prioritise resources. But maybe sometimes we should accept introduced species as kind of gateway drugs into appreciating wildflower meadows if filling an area with poppies, for example, which are not necessarily introduced, depending on where you are, I guess. Um, but if an area is full of poppies, then that can appeal to people in a way that perhaps an area full of oxide daisies might not. So there may be kind of halfway play, uh, points that we can meet in order to ensure that communities stay on board with conservation efforts. And knowing more about different bee species biology can make that better and more effective. So I will stop there and thank you all. And um, I'm happy to take questions and have discussions.